<laughs> Thanks for coming. This ought to be a real exciting uh, um, talk, anyway. So what we're doing today is um, we are going to go over this white water here. Um, well, that's it's whirlwind. Whirlwind. Whatever it is, it's a W game. Um, first of all, I am Kevin McCarthy, um, and this is my wife, Laura. We own Blizzard Mountain Pinball in Conifer, Colorado. Um, which is about 40 minutes away from here, um, southwest of Denver. Um, basically, you go up on 285, about 20 minutes from Seaport 70, um, up in the foothills. So, uh, it's a beautiful location. Um, we've been open since the beginning of October, and uh, having a wonderful time up there. I should say that Kevin spends hours and hours and hours every week cleaning and maintaining games. So I do. Definitely an expert on that. Um, well, I don't know about that. I, <laughs> I, I do spend a lot of time with it. I'm not at my 10,000 hours yet, though. Um, but I mean, that's one of the things that we are committed to doing with Blizzard Mountain Pinball is to provide clean, well-maintained games uh, to the extent that we can do so. Um, most of the games are, you know, we try to keep them fully functional. So every once in a while, we have one that breaks down for a few weeks while we're waiting on parts or something. But um, for the most part, you know, I think we've been pretty successful at keeping the games up and running. Uh, most of our games are currently out on the floor right now, um, getting beat up on. So hopefully they're continuing to run. I haven't actually been out there for a little while. So. Um, Pitball Showdown has been a place that, well, this is our what? Our 14th. 14th year. Um, we started doing this in 2005. I think that was the second year of the show. Um, that year, I believe we brought like six or eight games, maybe ten. Um, I can't even remember how many games we owned at that point. Um, we now have um, 39, 38 games. Actually, 39, because we just got Iron Man. Um, of which 36 are at our facility. Um, and 30 of them are here. So, it's a, it's, it's a labor of love for us, and we love Pinball Showdown. Um, this is yeah, but like the most fun weekend we have of the year, so. Um, it is challenging to keep them all up and running all weekend, and so part of what we'll be talking about is things that are most likely to go wrong um, for the game, um, so that if you, if you were going to bring a game to a show, or if you're just maintaining a game at home, um, what are the most common things that come up, um, how to recognize that, you know, that, um, but then also things go wrong on the show floor, um, so basically there's three, um, three areas that I usually consider when I'm working on a game. First, you know, we want to clean it. Um, but how deep do we want to clean it? You know, sometimes you can pull off ramps, you can pull off the entire surface of the play field, and really just do a deep cleaning on it. Um, that tends to take me, you know, a day or two, uh, depending on how many parts I lose in the process. Um, how many things I put together wrong and have to take back apart and put it back together right, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, so that's, it's a pretty labor-intensive process. Um, or you can just do kind of a surface cleaning where you're working around the parts that are already on the plate field. And for the most part, that's going to be good enough. Um, unless, you know, maybe it's a game that's new to you or has been, you know, out on route someplace and hasn't had the maintenance and attention that it needs. Um, then you probably want to consider tearing it all apart. And I've torn all of our games apart at least once, um, you know, just to kind of make sure I know where everything is and know how, how it all goes back together and everything. Uh, but for what we're doing here on, on Whirlwind, and I'm going to call it White Water at some point. So Again. <laughs> um, what we're doing here on Whirlwind is going to be just a real basic um, cleaning because it really isn't in that bad shape. Um, we also want to, we're also going to talk about repairs. Um, as you mentioned, you know, what's commonly going to go wrong and how do you prevent that from happening ahead of time so that you're not working on the game in the middle of the show floor. And then, um, obviously, there will be things that will go wrong in the show floor. You just, you know, metal pinball running around on a play field, you know, hitting things, what's going to happen? Um, unfortunately, things are going to happen. And uh, how do you deal with that? And then, you know, how do you set the game up so that it's fun for everybody to play? Um, who's your audience? Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, do you have 
um, specific things that would differ between what you would do on a showroom floor versus what you would do at home? Um, for the most part, at home, people tend to want the games to be, well, it depends on what kind of collector you are, but a lot of home collectors are perfectionists. They're going to be much more likely to want to dig much further deeper into the machine, get every little speck of it out of the machine, uh, which makes it a beautiful game. Um, unfortunately, I've played my fair share of beautiful games that don't play very well, um, just because of, you know, they have a lot of attention to the detail of you know making it look right, but then the pictures aren't strong, or um, some mechanical device doesn't work right, or something along those lines. So you really need to mix the two together. Um, as far as uh, the show floor is concerned, I want the game to be reliable. Um, so if it has some dirt on it, but I know that everything is mechanically sound, I'm not going to worry too much about it. Um, you know, if it's a game that I'm not as familiar with, I haven't had in my collection as long, I'm going to pay a lot more attention to the mechanics of it to make sure that it's going to last the weekend without me having to mess with it all weekend. Does that answer your question? Yeah. How in the world do you get 30 pinball games down here? <laughs> <laughs> we have a trailer that holds 10, and I actually did three round trips yesterday. Um, we had a lot of help. You know, it wasn't just me. There was. There is, uh, well, Laura helped. <laughs> um, Good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many people we had here, but it, it was. I think we had 12. 12. Well, yeah, probably about that. So um, we had a lot of help, and that was essential, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a couple people up in Conifer helping me, you know, roll the games out to the trailer, and I was actually in the trailer strapping everything down to make sure that it would stay in place. Um, and then we came down here, and they would take the dollies and you know roll everything in, and I'd just turn around and go right back up again. Um, so I mean, it took. I got here at nine o'clock, and we got all the games in by three. So it took me six hours to do all of that. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of work when you're doing it on this scale. So I'll talk a little bit about painting. You know, unfortunately, you may or may not get a chance to go see it from above, but you can also certainly come up and take a peek at it. Um, but um, it can be a little controversial about what products you use for cleaning. Um, we actually have a list, you'll see there's a paper in the back there that um, lists various supplies and um, tools that you might want to have. Um, but what we use for cleaning is uh, Novus. Um, we start off with Novus 2, Mind Scratch and Blue. Um, the reason it's a little controversial, some people think that it's a little abrasive. Um, and it cause some facial damage, but we've been using it for over 20 years and we have never really run into that problem, so we trust it. Um, you definitely don't want to use anything water-based, um, you know, like soap and water or Windex or anything like that, because it can soak into the wood and cause problems with plumbing or things like that. So, well, yeah. This play field, I'm just going to interject you, this play field has, if you take a closer look at it, and if you're ever in a market for a machine, um, it's something you want to watch out for. Uh, this plate field has a lot of what's known as planking on it, where there's a lot of vertical lines, and um, you'll see the cracks in the wood if you look carefully at the plate field. Um, eventually, we are actually going to replace this plate field. I have another one um, that's you know basically a new, brand new old stock plate field. Um, that's a very time and labor consuming process, so it just hasn't happened yet. Is there anything you can do to minimize the effect of the planking? Uh, not really, not once it's occurred. Um, I mean, you could, maybe you could get, you know, if you're really, really artistically inclined, you might be able to dab a little bit of, you know, the same, I mean, good luck, you know. Um, personally, if the game plays okay, I leave well enough alone. So I'm going to start cleaning with this, and then kind of as I go along, then I'll interject with, now I'm doing this stuff. Um, we do use these uh, little blue shop towels from uh, Costco. Um, they're just a little softer and um, they're strong. strong. They, they, hold up, <laughs> they hold up much better than normal paper towels do. And, and with this, um, if it was really filthy, um, you would want to kind of get a, a dab of it onto your, um, onto your towel. 
and then you're just kind of rubbing it onto the play field. If it's really dirty, you kind of want to um, just cover it and let it dry. Um, and then you can take something like, um, like a microfiber towel after it dries and, um, and wipe it off, and then we'll just get more of the filth off. But if it's not too bad, um, like this one's not too bad, then um, you can pretty much just wipe it off right away, and it'll just pick up the dirt that's on there. And like Kevin said, if you're um, really inclined to, or if, uh, if it really needs it, then you can also take off the ramps, take off um, just anything that's kind of in your way to get into, you know, between the top bumpers and all of that. So, um, but yeah, for our purposes today, we're just... Can you try the projector on? We would love to. We would love to. <laughs> What's the difference between Novus 1, 2, and 3? Uh, well, Novus 3 <laughs> is, is a much more abrasive. <laughs> It's it's more it's more creamy. It's much more abrasive. You want to be very sparing if you ever want to use that. Um, I don't use it um, personally. I've never really found the need. I've got a small bottle of it. I think it's in there. Um, but it's just um, it's it's pretty abrasive. Um, Novus Two is is less abrasive. It is still you don't want to just you know really hard with it. But um, you know we've never had an issue where where I feel like it's wearing the play field or anything. Like that. If you read on pin side, you're going to find uh, religious arguments about it. Um, Novus one, Novus one, and we do use that one as kind of a finish up. It's it's much more liquid based, um, and we will spray that on paper towel just like you would Windex or something, and just you know, wipe down the play field with it. That gets any dust in there. Yes. Does it make any difference if there's a mylar covering on the wood? No, I use it either way. I use it either way. Okay. Well, you see the dirt on your cloth? Yes. Yes. So, so we actually played this game not long before bringing it, and so it's just been played at the, you know, today, since 11. You can already see, like, there's some growing on there. So a lot of it is just kind of, you know, the ball kind of carries dirt on it, the rubber kind of disintegrates a little bit. So it's, it's, it's basically carbon and rubber that you're seeing on there. Uh, carbon from all the necks. Every time, every time you know you hit a flipper, it's got a plunger that whacks against the end of the coil, the coil stop. That's going to release just a little bit of carbon dust, and that gets in the air, flies around the play field, and ends up you know where the ball travels. Um, it's kind of inevitable, and all the me mechanicals in the pinball do that. Um, we've got some old flippers up here that I'll, I'll pass out a little bit later, and you can kind of see what happens as they get worn. But um, it's basically pieces of metal, really tiny, you know, think about abrasive. Um, you've got little, just really tiny pieces of just carbon on the play field that's flying around all over the place all the time. And that's what you're seeing. And some, you know, sometimes, especially if you have black rubber on the play fields, there may be a little bit of rubber on there as well. So, you want me to continue? You want to go on to Okay. Um, so when you're repairing the machine, a couple of things to be real careful about. First of all, you notice we don't have the machine turned on right now. Uh, you don't want to work on the machine when it's powered on. Um, you can accidentally short something and turn a five minute project into a three or four day project because you know you short circuited something in the, in the uh, circuit boards in the back. Um, and it's real easy to do stuff like that if the power's on, especially on machines like Whirlwind, where when you open the coin door, it does not actually cut the high voltage um, power to the machine. Some of the newer Williams games from the mid 90s on and um, Stern games up until a couple of years ago would cut the power. Oh, you got a screen. Um, so those, it's not quite as risky, but I still don't like to do it. Um, sometimes you have to in order to be able to troubleshoot a problem. You know, sometimes you have to have the power on with whatever mechanic you're working on to, you know, actually working and you're fiddling with it, trying to figure out what's wrong. Uh, but if at all possible, you want to have the power off. Um, yeah, you, basically, if, if there's something wrong with the electronics in the back, uh, unless you kind of know what you're doing with electronics, it's not really something you want to jump into. If you have junk boards, you know, you want to practice your soldering on that. Um, there is a lot of information online um, as far as you know how to do soldering, how to do um, you know, how to replace components, and whatnot. Um, 
you know, definitely read up on that if you feel inclined to try it yourself. Um, but you can mess up good um, circuit boards with inept soldering, and that can be a really big problem. And the boards can be very expensive to replace if they're available at all. Um, so, you know, it's just, you, you want to be real careful with that. Um, another real important thing, especially when you get a machine that's new to you, you want to go through all the fuses on it and just double check and make sure they're all the correct value. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had a 5 amp fuse or a 20 amp fuse just stuck in where a 5 amp fuse is supposed to go. That's a recipe for fires. You don't want to do that. Um, I've also seen um, you know, a fuse where somebody soldered a piece of wire from one end of the fuse to the other. Um, you know, though I, I call those no blow fuses. Um, because I've seen that multiple times as well. You know, somebody just was trying to get the machine up and running, and rather than, you know, they didn't have the correct part on hand, so they just stuck something in there. You may as well just stick a bolt in there. Um, but you really do want to make sure that the game is used correctly, because it is a fire hazard if it's not. You got specs of all your games, so you can find out what goes where? You usually, if there's a manual, it's usually listed in there. A lot of the manuals are available on ipdb.org. Um, otherwise, you can, you know, you can search, like if it's a Stern game, you can go to the Stern website. They have manuals um, online there, and you can look up that kind of thing. Uh, frequently, it's listed there'll be a card or a placard inside the game that will also list the fuse values. Um, so, you know, it, it can, um, the, the information's available. Um, but it's just, it's something you want to be very careful about because you don't want, you don't want it to light on fire. Um, and then if it's a used game, the previous owner might have done some pretty unorthodox things to the game. Um, like for instance, our Earthshaker, which is out on the floor, um, I had an issue with one of the, if you think of the lamp matrix, it's actually an 8 by 8 um, grid of lights. Um, so there's 64 possible combinations on most games. Um, one of the rows of lamps was not working on my Earthshaker, and it affected 8, eight lights on the play field. When I opened up the back box, I found and there's supposed to be this little 5 watt um, resistor. I think it was a cement resistor, it's about this big. And instead, it was soldered in this huge thing. It was the same value, but it was absolutely huge. I have no idea where they got it from. Probably some TV repair place or something. I, I honestly don't know where it came from. Um, and it was pulling on a wire that had then come unsoldered from the um, board and was causing that particular row of lamps to not work. So I had to go back through. It took me a while to figure it out because I couldn't figure out why this thing was there. I didn't even realize it was a resistor at first. Um, couldn't figure out why somebody did that. Um, so I, I figured it out and got it working and now it's it's all good. And I, you know, The board actually was damaged by that. I had to solder some jumper wires in its place. Uh, to keep everything connected as it should have been. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there, who knows what the previous owners could have done. Um, I've seen some interesting flipper parts. Um, you know, people will use whatever they have on hand and they get creative and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, if you have the play field lifted, um, you know, if you're working on the underside of the play field, make sure that it's, uh, um, that it's secure. Um, you don't want that thing falling on your head. There's a lot of pretty sharp parts under there. <laughs> so you most of them have a prop bar, or they pull out and you lift up, or anything like that. Um, I have had a couple of play fields fall, and it's not fun. Um, so you just want to make sure it's secure. And then as you're cleaning and working on games, you're going to get little small scrapes and bumps and things because you're going to be working under a ramp, and it'll be sharp, and you won't realize it. You, now you've got a scrape in your arm. Um, just be prepared for that. Um, when I'm going through repairing a game, I do have uh, certain priorities that I like to go through. First of all, I want to fix any playability issues, so things like flippers, almost. I want to make sure the flippers are strong and they you know, are crisp and they're not sticky or anything like that. Um, I also will look at pop bumpers for the same type of thing in slingshots. 
Um, basically, anything where the ball that reacts with the ball and sends it off in some direction, I'm going to pay more attention to. Uh, but flippers, number one. Um, I'm going to fix anything that affects gameplay directly, as opposed to cosmetics. I don't care so much if I have a cracked plastic on there. Um, I want to make sure that the gameplay is good. Um, I also am going to fix things that affect the experience, especially if it's at my facility or if it's if I bring it in here. So, for instance, you know, the castle on Medieval Madness, you know, it comes up and it pops and explodes and everything. Um, if that's not working, it doesn't really affect gameplay, maybe, but it does affect the experience. So, I'm going to. I'm going to try to get that working before I'm worried about cracked plastics and paint missing from the plate wheel, that sort of thing. Not to mention the fact that I'm not really an artist, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not into the um, plate wheel touch-ups and that sort of thing. Um, so, as I said, the flippers are the number one thing. And I have here, uh, this is a pretty worn this is a pretty worn mechanism. Um, it was, you know, part of a game. I, I think actually this was a game that was on location. I think Dan gave it to me. But at any rate, um, one of the things I'm holding, I'm holding the, the plunger down all the way against the bottom here, and this has quite a bit of play in it. Um, when there's play in the flipper like this, it affects the accuracy of your shot. Um, that also means that it'll also make the flip weaker as well. Um, so it'll make the ramps harder to make and, and it'll be inconsistent. You'll think, well, I'm hitting this at the exact same time and sometimes it's going up the ramp and sometimes it's hitting a post. Um, it's because there's play in here and it, and it affects all of that. Um, I also have one here. This one's uh, got brand new parts in it. And you know, there's very little play in this one. So this is going to be a really clean, crisp flipper. Um, so what did you replace? What I replaced was... Coils? No, no. You, generally, you don't replace the coils. Um, this is the mechanism right here that you would replace. This is um, a plunger and link. Um, this this uh, uh, prowl here is... You can actually reuse this metal part. Um, Pinball Life actually sells each of these parts individually. And generally, there's like a little bushing in here that sometimes I need to replace. Um, sometimes you need to replace this whole metal bracket thing because it won't grip on the, the flipper goes into here, this hole, and it grips onto it. Sometimes it won't grip anymore if it's if the metal's old and fatigued. Um, so you might need to replace this, that part. But the part that wears is right here, um, where that pivot is, and this pivot up here. Um, that's that's what causes this to be loose, and then this end is what is slamming against the coil stop all the time, and this one has been flattened. There's actually supposed to be a tapered edge on here, and it's been flattened over time. That also causes the flipper to travel too far. So instead of it maybe coming up like this, it may come up like this, um, and that can also affect your shots. Doing okay. Yeah. I'm just going to give a quick update of the Novus is all done. My next tool is a little toothbrush, um, just because sometimes the um, that Novus 2 will get into like the little star posts um, or other places that are a little hard to reach, and so this will just make sure that that gets all off of there. And then our next step is going to be um, that we'll be spraying spraying a little bit of the Novus 1 on, and then I'll just kind of like do a final polish on, on all of that. So that's kind of step that I'm on now. <laughs> Just I'll go ahead and pass these around here. So that's the old one. And this is the new one. Um, I would if I had let it dry. Um, and, and then you can just kind of rub it off and then just kind of um, get off a little bits of debris. Um, but because we were just kind of like putting it on and taking it right off again because it wasn't that dirty then. Um, Kind of skip that stuff, but but yeah, if you had one that was kind of dirty that you were needing to let it sit for a little while, how long, when it's really dirty, how long would you just end up letting it sit? It doesn't really, I mean, until, until it's powdery, it's like half an hour to an hour. Yeah. So it's um, kind of like car wax. It's kind of like that. It's not a wax, but it is, it, I mean, it's kind of a similar, similar thing. Um, 
I've got some other parts up here that I'm going to hand around. Um, this is another um, plunger and link. This one has actually gotten so um, there's actually a ridge on the edge here, and that can cause a very weak flipper because it's going inside this coil sleeve, and um, this coil sleeve is also pretty worn, but it'll actually catch on it and um, cause the flipper. I mean, that, that's just extra friction that doesn't need to be there. See that, and then this is the other part, and you can see that there's just looseness in this. So. When you guys are cleaning the ramps, are you uh, just using regular Novus on? Yep. What if the ramp has a lot of buildup on it, and you're unable to get it off? Um. Because I've heard of um, flame polishing. You can uh, flame polishing. I mean, if you if you are brave enough to try that. Um, that's a, you can ruin a ramp that way. Um, I've never, honestly, I've never tried it. I've never felt the need for a ramp to be that clean. Um, if I really think that, you know, usually if a ramp is that dirty, it's probably broken anyway, and it might need to be replaced. I've not experienced the need to actually do a flame polish. Um, you know, if I, if I was in that situation, I, you bet I would start studying the YouTube videos on it. And I try to find a ramp that's already broken and practice on it first before I took it to the real thing. Um, here's an example where there's, this is a coil stop, and it's got the, the sleeve is actually stuck onto it. Um, so this is another bad part. Um, I'm not sure if I've got any coil stops here that are loose. I kind of wanted to show that to you. Um, but basically this, you know, you can't, you can't pull this apart. You know, I'm sure somebody could have really tried, but um, this is another, you know, cause of weak flippers or flippers that are, um, you know, not very accurate. It is, it's just worn. And then I've got an actual flipper here that if you pull it apart, you can see, I shouldn't really be able to pull it apart, but the internals inside here, it's got little, you know, little crossbars here, and they are cracked. And that would cause this to deflect a little bit when it hits the ball, when the ball hits it. And again, it's going to make the flipper seem weak. So, and then I've got a nylon, I'm sorry? The flipper's the easiest part to get, though. This? Flipper, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, this isn't, although... It still takes some time because you have to make sure you align it correctly when you put the new one on. Otherwise, you're going to have flippers that are, you know, uneven. Yes? Can you 3D print those flippers? I wouldn't think it would be strong enough. Hmm. Um, I have very limited experience with 3D printing. Um, and for the most part, I found that it doesn't really create a part that's strong enough to hold up to the rigors of a ball, a metal ball hitting it at speed. Yeah, especially for a flipper. Um, it's you know, probably going to cost you more to print than to buy. And that too. That too. So I'll go ahead and pass these. This is, this is a nylon bushing. This is the flipper actually fits into here. Um, what happens over time is these will develop cracks. Uh, this one is just dirty for the most part. It doesn't really look that bad. But they'll develop cracks, and then the flipper won't, won't be in here straight anymore, and they'll actually start rubbing against the play field. That's obviously very bad. You don't want that. Um, I've also had situations, these are actually held on to the flipper. You can actually see wherever the flipper is, uh, the parts that I handed out earlier. You can see this is installed with three um, Phillips screws. And they have, they're supposed to have nuts on the back side to kind of hold everything in place. Well, over a few hundred thousand flips, sometimes those get loose. And when they get loose, they'll hang in their cockeyed, and again, the flipper will rub against the plate bill. Um, had that happen on my whodunit machine before we happened to catch it as you know we were taking it apart. We noticed that it was loose, and it had just started to rub on the plate field. So fortunately, we caught it before it caused any real damage. Um, but yeah, these are all things that you want to pay attention to. So I'll go ahead and hand these out as well. Yeah. Generally, how much time does it take to pull the flippers and get them on the workbench? Pretty quick. Um, to pull the flippers out, basically, 
The first thing you're going to do is this, this is the, again, this is another crank assembly. Um, the flipper fits through this hole. Uh, this bolt, you loosen this bolt to loosen it, you pull the flipper out. Then you can undo, there's eight, you generally there's eight hex, quarter inch hex screws that you undo from the bottom of the, of the play field. You also, depending on uh, what kind of flipper it is, you might have to desolder a couple switches um, and the stroke switches and whatnot uh, in order to get it actually out of the play field. You might actually have to desolder it, all the three wires from the flipper itself, and then you can bring it to your workbench and mess with it. Um, doesn't take very long. Um, for me personally, I hate soldering, so that's the part that takes the longest. Um, but, um, you know, when you get down to the end of it and you have a nice crisp flipper again, it's definitely worth it. Well worth it. So, um, speaking of soldering, I wanted to talk about, um, I've got a couple of things here. First of all, I have a desoldering gun. And what this is, this has, you probably can't see it, but it has a little hole on the end and this is actually a vacuum. So when this heats up, it melts the solder, you hit the button and it sucks the solder right off. Um, this is an incredible tool for anything that you need to desolder. Because it goes and you're done. Um, once it heats up. It may take a little while to heat up, but once, once you've done that. And I can desolder wires from flippers using this. Um, I can also, you know, desolder components from, from boards and whatnot. Um, yes? How much does one of those generally run? That's a good question. Um, I want to say it's like $100, $150 maybe. Um, it's been several years since I've actually bought one, so I, I haven't had to look for one for a while. I don't remember how much I paid for it. Oh, and what was the brand for that one again? This is a, a, a Hako, H-A-K-K-O 808. Um, again, they might they might have a, a newer version out now, um, but you want something similar to that, just because it makes your job so much easier, and it's well worth the money to, to spend on something like this versus trying to use a, a, a desoldering braid or something like that, um, which I tried to use for several years and ruined a couple of boards that way. So this is this is much quicker. Uh, the other thing that I use a lot, is, and this is just a soldering iron, and it's a mess here, but this is a temperature controlled soldering iron. This is a Weller WESD-51. Um, it has a temperature control knob, and it has a digital readout that tells me what the temperature is of the, of the tip. Um, you know, I, again, I hate soldering, so I like to have tools that actually, you know, make the job easier for me. And this, this is going to beat any 40 watt pencil, you know, thing that doesn't have temperature control because you can overheat your board real easily or something like that. Um, so again, I recommend going out and getting good equipment um, if you're going to do a lot of repair work on boards. And if you have pinball machines, um, sooner or later you're going to have a wire come off of the coil and you're going to need to solder back on. So, um, you know, I highly recommend it. You're looking at me like you have something to say. No, this one is done. <laughs> I'm moving on to using the Wildcat rubber cleaner. Um, and there's obviously a lot of rubber pieces on the play field as well, all the rubber rings, the uh, flippers. Um, so if you notice that they're in pretty bad shape or getting frayed or anything like that, then this would be a good time to replace those. Some of them are, you know, come off pretty easily, um, like that one off of the slingshot. Other ones, you have to kind of take some things apart to be able to get to the rings. Um, in which case, you can use um, adjustable wrench. No, that's a ratcheting wrench. That's a ratcheting wrench. Um, to get off those pieces. Basically, the ratcheting wrench has one end that ratchets so that you can kind of stick it underneath. Um, a ramp or something that might be in your way of using a normal nut driver, and then you can just ratchet it off. Um, I find those things extremely helpful. <laughs> this here is going to use a little bit of it on your towel again. And, and then you're going to spill it all over the like that's my <laughs> <laughs> um, And then you just rub it on there, and it gets a lot of it off of it. So, 
the older rigs sometimes just get stained, so it might not come out looking pristine. Um, but um, yeah, newer rings you can just still just wipe right off, and it'll look like new again. Yeah. It does condition the rubber as well. Yeah. Do you find it's worth the trouble? I mean, I just replace. I I will replace them, but you know we go through a lot of it um, because I mean it just things get dirty pretty quickly when they're getting played a lot, and I would probably have to buy stock in a company that sold them <laughs> if I had to buy them that frequently. Um, so yes, I do find that it's worth cleaning them versus replacing them, um, especially since there's a, quite a bit of labor involved in replacing them when you have to start taking parts apart to get to them. So an older machine, an older EM machine or early solid state, yeah, I mean, you can just pull the rings off and replace them. A newer machine where you have to take ramps off and stuff to get to them, it's a lot easier to clean. Sometimes there is just really good condition overall, it's just they've gotten all the, the dirt build up on it, so right. you just kind of do that. Do you rotate the rubber around? Absolutely. I absolutely do that. You'll see that if you look at our games, you'll see that there's little pop marks out of the bottom. And when it gets all the way around to the other side, then I replace it. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit that. <laughs> so when you're cleaning the rubbers, you don't necessarily have to take them off to get them clean? No. No. You, you, for the most part, it's it's not so much that it's it's more it's a visual. You want it to look nice. It doesn't really affect um, how the game plays. Um, although at, at the very beginning, after you first clean it, you'll find that the that the ball will grab onto the rubber a little bit more, so that you end up a little bit more wild um, ball play. That wears away pretty quick, and you end up with it coming back pretty close to the way it was before. <coughs> Um, so I, one thing I wanted to discuss was, um, you know, when you're doing rebuilds of flippers or any other mechanical part, um, the coils generally do not need to be replaced. Um, either a coil is going to work or it's not. Um, if you have a situation where a coil feels weak, it is usually something is binding or something is sticking or something is not lined up properly, it is not usually the coil itself. Um, it is kind of a false positive though because if you if you then replace the coil frequently you'll find that whatever device it is that you're working on suddenly works a lot better so you think well it was the coil it generally was all the other things you did in order to replace the coil um, that actually solved the problem um, there are a couple of exceptions to that um, if for instance you saw the coil sleeve that's floating around here somewhere um, if you cannot easily insert the coil sleeve into the coil, then chances are that coil is overheated at some point and it's, it's actually expanded or contracted to hold what's in there. Uh, that coil does need to be replaced in that case if you can't easily you know, slide the coil sleeve in or out. Um, and then sometimes you will have a damaged coil where either it overheated at some point or it just has a, a defect where it'll actually short and blow a fuse. Um, I, I don't think I've ever actually run into that myself. But um, I know that it can happen. So if you have a coil and it's just immediately blowing the fuse, you take an ohmmeter, make sure you, it'll probably read that it's a dead short. Yeah, in that case, you need to replace it. But for the most part, you know, you're going to have either the coil works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it's because there's something, something's not hooked up correctly or it's something binding or something like that. So look elsewhere besides the coil itself. Um, one of the other things that causes weak flippers in particular, uh, flipper button switches on the cabinet. Um, I actually had an issue with Dr. Dude, that's actually in the tournament room right now, where I was getting the kind of weird, every once in a while I would flip and it would just be weak, and then I'd flip it again and it would be strong. And it was very variable um, on the strength of the flipper, and it was driving me nuts. I was trying to figure out why this was happening, and it turned out that it was the flipper switches that are on the side of the cabinet. They were probably the original flipper switches, and the contacts had worn almost completely away. Um, so sometimes it was not making a good contact and wasn't getting enough uh, current through there, and so I'd get a good flip, just randomly. Um, so you want to look at, uh, if you've got a weak flipper, you want to look at the flipper button switches on the side of the cabinet. You also want to look at the inner stroke switches um, if it's a game like Whirlwind, or a game that came out in the 80s up to about 92, 93, the end of stroke switch 
um, is where all the current went through. And basically what would happen is um, when you flip the flipper, the end of stroke switch is closed and when it reached the end, you know, it would open the switch. That prevents the high current from going through the coil longer than necessary. Um, and it will keep the coil from burning out. But if the, co if the contacts are burnt or worn, then you're not going to get enough current going through there and you're going to get a weak flip. So those, um, those are two things that you want to look at if you're getting weak flippers. Um, and everything else seems to be okay. Those are commonly overlooked, especially the flipper cabinet switches because I overlooked it myself. Um, if you have other coils that feel weak, uh, for slingshots, pop bumpers, that sort of thing, uh, first thing I'm going to look at is the, is the coil sleeve. It seems like replacing a coil sleeve makes the whole mechanism just work a lot better. Um, I, I think it's just, you know, dirt and stuff gets in there and uh, causes excess friction and you replace it and it works a lot better. Um, again, you can also replace the, the plunger link if it's flattened because it happens the same way it happens with the flippers that I sent around. You know, the end of it is supposed to be tapered. If it gets flattened, it, it, it can get weak that way as well. Um, think about right here. Oh, I had an issue with Rolling Stones, which is out on the floor, um, where the right flipper just always felt weak. And I had done everything. I had replaced the end of stroke switch. It actually doesn't use the same type of end of stroke switch. Uh, the computer controls the current going to the flipper. But the end of stroke switch can still cause it to be weak if it opens too soon because then the computer thinks the flipper is fully flipped before it really is. And it also will prevent the flipper from collapsing if the ball hits it. Um, so a functioning end strokes, which is still important on newer machines. Um, I finally figured out, and this goes back to who knows what people have done before you own the machine, I finally figured out that the coil itself was wrong. Um, it turned out that it was a coil that was meant to be used for one of those little, little you know, two inch flippers that just sends the ball across the play field. It was on one of the bottom flippers and I was trying to hit ramps with it. Um, that wasn't working too well. So once I figured that out, I did have to replace that coil. You, know, you want to make sure that the coil is the correct coil for, the, for what's called for. You don't know what's happened to the machine before you got it. Um, now you can actually hit the ramps, so problem solved. Um, you know, if, if you have a mechanism where something is sticking, um, I generally will take it apart and clean it. Um, you don't want to use lubricants. Uh, you want to keep your oil and WD-40 especially far away from pinball machines um, because they will collect dust and dirt and you know, if something needs to be lubricated, if something is sticking and it needs to be lubricated, chances are what really needs to be replaced. Silicone Limited, I mean maybe on gearing and that kind of stuff, but I'm not going to use it on plungers or anything like that. It's meant to be operated dry. Um, so if something is sticking, it, it needs to be cleaned or replaced. Um, I had an issue with fire where um, there is where it kicks the ball out from the trough up onto the, you know, where you shoot the ball. It actually uses the same mechanism to release the ball from the lock. So, you know, under the building and everything, it locks the balls. Um, it uses the same exact mechanism to release that. Um, it would actually um, kick the ball out and then it would stick there. So the balls behind it couldn't travel down in, you know, to get kicked out themselves. And it would cause the machine to get all confused um, because there'd be like no ball here but a ball stuck here and it couldn't figure out how to deal with that because that situation really shouldn't exist. Um, I had to take apart the whole mechanism um, and I cleaned it out. And I actually used that Wildcat um, rubber cleaner and I used that to clean all the dust and debris and dirt and everything and get any, any lubricants that somebody else used before me off. Um, and that freed everything up. And, you know, I didn't leave, I mean, there's probably a little bit of residue there, but I didn't really leave any, you know, it wasn't wet or anything when I put it back together. So, you know, you put everything back together dry. Um, and then it's, it's worked perfectly for two, three years since then. Um, so it's, yeah, dirt. And somebody probably put some oil on it at some point because it wasn't working right. It freed it up for a little while and then it just accumulated all that carbon and dust and everything else and got, just gummed everything up. So if I clean something and then it doesn't work, now I'm looking for a replacement box. 
now since you're talking about replacement parts, if it's a hard to find replacement part, what do you end up doing? Do you end up it, if it's a well, if it's a really hard to find replacement part, um, I haven't really run into that situation because most of my machines are relatively recent. I mean, I have machines from the 80s to today, so most of the parts are still pretty common and available. Um, if you start going back further into EMs and whatnot, um, I suppose what I would do is just make sure, first of all, that I've got it assembled correctly, which it should do anyway, and make sure that I really truly did clean it and that I don't have anything that's left over. If I can see that the part is damaged, um, you know, you might not have much of a choice but to, you know, call up Steve Young at Pinball Resource and hope that he has something. Um, you know, or you might have to try to cobble something together yourself. I mean, you, there's just not a lot of options if, there's, if the parts aren't available. Okay. Yeah. How are you doing over there? Yay! That one wasn't too bad, so. Yeah. How are we doing on time, by the way? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Ten minutes? Okay. I'm going to leave the um, glass off in case you want to come take a look at it. But the last, last product that we use is just, um, just glass cleaner for both sides. Um, as, as Pat and Tracy know, like you can get a lot of fingerprints on <laughs> both sides of the glass. Um, and then for our purposes, we use an ammonia-free um, glass yes. cleaner. It's especially important for um, Invisiglass, that kind of thing? Yes. Thing? Any, anything that's anti-glare glass, like Invisiglass or the Stern HD glass or uh, the Jersey Jack stuff that they use, um, most, for the most part, it's just going to be you know, standard tempered glass that you have on your machine. Obviously, it does need to be tempered. If you ever break a, a glass, you want to replace it with tempered. Um, otherwise, you know, somebody else can come along and break it and severely hurt themselves on shards of uh, uh, broken glass. R related to that, I was just going to suggest that you add to your list of things to check when you have a game new to you, mm -hmm. is to make sure there's not plate glass exactly. in, in there. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, so, okay, so we're, we're down to about 10 minutes here. Um, I wanted to talk about rubber rings when you're replacing them. Um, there's different types of rings that you can use. Uh, you've got standard pinball rubber, which is really cheap. Um, you're talking about the flipper rubbers? Uh, any rubber. Okay. Um, so pros that it's really cheap, cons is it usually doesn't last as long and you have limited color options. You know, basically it's black or white. Um, but red. for, for, for yeah, the rings you can get red or sometimes yellow. Um, you also, there's also super bands. Um, pros on that is you get very vibrant translucent colors and it's also very long lasting. Um, cons is it's really, really hard rubber. It's not, in fact, it's not rubber, it's silicone. Um, and it, it negatively affects gameplay, in my opinion. But you know, other people really like it, so I mean, it's a personal decision. Um, the Titan com competition rings, which is what I tend to use more frequently as time goes on, um, it is longer lasting than rubber, although it does tend to split um, after a while, and it, it will break, especially on slingshots and stuff like that. Um, it comes in a variety of colors, which is nice. You can kind of mix and match it with your plate field. Um, it is more expensive, though, than a standard pinball rubber. So it just kind of depends on what you want. Um, then light bulbs, I've got around here someplace. Um, just, this is just, again, this is from you know basically 1980 forward as far as different bulbs. Uh, different, I've got different varieties of bulbs here that are very common in pinball machines. Um, we've got, you want to do a quick once over when you're looking through, um, looking through your game just to make sure that you don't have any bulbs that are burnt out. Um, and you can go through the lamp test or you can just kind of do a visual around the play field. Most of the general illumination lights, stuff under the slingshots and stuff you get from underneath, you take a quarter inch nut driver and just drop the bulb out and place it put back in. Um, a lot of the feature lights, sometimes you can do that with the feature lights as well. Sometimes they're on top of the plate, but sometimes you have to take stuff off in order to get to them. Um, it just kind of depends on the way they design the machine. Um, got here, this is a 555 ball that has a wedge base, uh, very common. Um, this is a 44 ball, 
Uh, they also make 47 bulbs. Um, it's the exact same uh, base here. Uh, the 47s run cooler, they're also dimmer. Uh, the 44s are brighter, but they're hotter. So it, it's, again, it's kind of personal preference as for which one you want to use. I tend to use the 44s because I like a nice bright machine, but um, there's certainly arguments to be used for 47s as well. Um, these are flashers. This is a 906 flasher. Um, again, it's got the wedge base, kind of like the 555s do, except they're bigger. Um, and then these are 89s, which are, again, similar to the, the 44s that has the bayonet base. Um, these four types of bulbs will cover probably 90% of the bulbs that are in your game if they're made from 1984. Um, you know, feel free to come take a look at those if you like. Um, you also have LEDs. Um, lots of LEDs out there. Most, in fact, all new machines are made with LEDs now. Uh, personally, I find I don't care for LEDs in older machines because they tend to flicker. And my eye catches the flicker as I'm watching the ball go across the play field. Uh, that being said, I will use LEDs in places that are hard to get to, especially pop bumpers and places where vibration will cause the filament to blow out quickly. Um, otherwise, I, I personally prefer the look of, of uh, incandescence in older games. That's a personal decision. Um, you know, there's a lot of beautiful LED-based games out there, and um, as long as the game plays good, I'm up for it. Um, General troubleshooting, um, whenever you're confronted with some kind of a problem, I always fix what I know is wrong first. A lot of times you'll have another problem that seems unrelated, and you found this little wire that's off the play field someplace. Well, that might actually be related, so fix it, and then see where you're at. Um, on Dr. Dude, I had a drop target that would not work. I actually pulled the board off, expecting it to be an opto, because those, those, they have these little U-shaped uh, where it shines a beam of light from one side to the other, and then the, the, um, the drop target has a blade that interrupts that beam, and that's how it knows whether the drop target is up or down. I fully expected it to be an opto. I pulled it off, and I realized that somebody had already replaced the opto first. So then I started thinking about it, and um, I went around to other parts of the play field, and I found a wire loose. Turns out that wire, if you know about the switches, they're very similar to the lamps in that it's an 8x8 matrix. So you've got eight switches daisy chained together. Um, the wire that came off was actually daisy chained to the opto that wasn't working. So it, it was on the opposite side of the play field. So I saw that, I put it back on, and all of a sudden my opto started to work again. And it didn't look like it was related at all. So whenever you're dealing with a problem, even if it seems unrelated, fix what you see that's wrong first, and then see where you're at. Don't make more work for yourself. Um, The switch matrix itself can be kind of a troublesome thing. I'm not going to go into great detail here because we're kind of running out of time. But just know that if you hit a switch and some other switch on the opposite side of the play field goes off at the same time, you've got a switch matrix issue. Um, probably it's a bad diode. It can also be each switch on a matrix has a diode on it. Uh, it can be that the diode is reversed. You know, somebody did repair work there before you, or even you did it yourself and you miswired the switch. That can cause all sorts of funky things to happen that seem just really strange. Um, chances are it's going to be a switch, a dial issue. It could be that one of the wires in the switch is also grounded to something on the, on the plate bill. I've seen that happen before too. Um, so basically, um, if you see something like that, don't panic. Um, go on to Google, start researching the switch matrix, and chances are you're going to find the problem. Um, you know, for more help, uh, Pinsight is a great resource. Um, there's a lot of help there. Um, there's also a lot of uh, um, drama. So, um, you know, you kind of have to read past the drama and get past some of the personal decisions. And the meat, the meat is there, though. There's a lot of help there. Um, you can go Google stuff. There's also, um, there's like a pin wiki, I think it is, um, that has a lot of detailed information as well. Um, chances are, if something has gone wrong with your machine, somebody else has seen it and they've written about it. So go read it up. Um, you'll find a lot of very similar things. I've solved a lot of problems doing nothing but looking to see if somebody had something similar go wrong, and sure enough, they did. And I could apply whatever their situation was to the situation I'm seeing, and I got the game back up and running.
Um, for repairs at a show, uh, packing your toolbox. Um, you want a socket wrench, especially a five, five eighths for the um, leg bolts. Generally, if it's a relatively, you know, again, 1980 forward machine, unless you have something non-standard on there. Um, you want a quarter inch nut driver, a five sixteenths inch nut driver, or eleven thirty seconds inch nut driver. Most all three of them are in a little toolbox there. You also want the same size as ratcheting wrenches, um, so that you can get underneath underneath plastics. I've got lists and stuff here, so you don't need to try to remember all that. I was going to say that's what's on that flyer back there. If you're when you're leaving, you can grab one of those, and they have yeah. all the tools that we recommend that you pack in your toolbox that you're probably going to need. Um, I use a digital level for leveling the play field. Um, the model I happen to use is a Craftsman. We've actually got two of them this year because we had so many people helping us. Um, I find the digital level works works great. I mean, there, it may be off by a tenth of a degree. You're probably not going to notice that when you're playing. Um, but it gives a nice, cons consistent um, baseline for leveling your machine. We're usually, you know, you want to be at zero side to side. You want to kind of it and make sure that it's not, sure not teeter-tottering. You want to make sure that it's solidly on the floor. Um, zero side to side. I usually pitch it about seven degrees uh, front to back. Yes? Do you measure side to side on the play field or on the glass? You measure it on the play field. That is a great question. Um, do not measure it on the glass because cabinets are not perfect. Um, you will find that if you measure it level on the glass and then you put it on the play field, there's a very good chance you're going to be off by a degree or two. Um, maybe not that much, but you'll be off by a, ten a few tenths of a degree. Um, so take the time, pull the glass off, and, and measure it on the play field. Um, general parts, I bring light bulbs, I bring parts to rebuild flippers in case the flipper part breaks while it's here. Um, and I also will bring you know, rubber rings and that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes you'll find that others at the show will have parts if you don't have them. Um, you know, I don't like to rely on that, but sometimes you have no choice because you get some obscure switch that breaks somewhere. I had ACDC go down one year because I, I a switch died in one of the um, one of the saucers. And so the ball would go in the saucer, the game wouldn't recognize it, do a ball search to pop it out. I did not have that switch and nobody had it. So I now have five of them. Um, just to make sure that that never happens again. You got an issue? Okay. Um, when you do your initial clean, do you guys clean the cabinets out? Or do you suggest not to even clean the inside of the cabinets out? I'm, I'm, I'll take a vacuum and kind of clean it around a little bit. I mean, again, having a clean inside of the cabinet doesn't really affect gameplay. So it's more of a, I know it's there and it's driving me nuts type situation versus somebody's really going to know, hey, this cabinet is filthy. Um, I will take, you know, I, I may clean the outside of the cabinet. Actually, Laura's probably more likely to do that than I am. Um, but um, the inside, I don't worry about too much, personally. Yes? How about the pinballs themselves? You can clean the pinballs themselves. You can also replace them. Uh, some people, uh, especially on pin side, again, you can get into a huge debate about people, you know, how often you want to replace the balls. Some people will replace them after 50 plays. I think that's a little ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I, I will replace them when I start noticing that they're getting scratched up and dull. Um, but again, you know, we have, I don't even know how many pinballs we have now. We probably got about 200 of them. And that becomes a significant investment <laughs> when you need to replace all 200 of them. Um, so I will, you know, if I suspect that a ball's gotten magnetized or something like that, then yeah, I'll go ahead and replace it. Um, if it's got a big scratch in it, I'll go ahead and replace it. And I'll look at them as I, when I clean the plate, I'll look at them and just make sure that they still look okay. Um, little surface scratches, I just don't worry about. Um, you know, if I did that, I'd go broke replacing them all the time. Plastics. Crack plastics. Yeah. Yes. Find them anywhere, or do you have to make your own? <laughs> um, for the most part, if it doesn't affect the gameplay, I just leave it. Um, if like, for instance, on Jurassic Park, we had a plastic that one of the sink socket plastics just sheared completely off. It was gone. And I found it in the bottom of the cabinet. Um, for that one, I was able to find these cheesy dinosaur, I don't even know what it was from, but I found slingshot plastics that just had dinosaurs on them. It's like, okay, I'm just going to use that because the ball was getting stuck 
you know, in, it would get airborne and get stuck inside the slingshot all the time with the plastic missing. Um, you know, again, you do what you have to do. You know, there's not original Jurassic Park plastics out there right now. Um, at least there weren't any available when I looked. So, um, you do what you have to do to keep the game running. Are there some reproductions of plastics there? Sometimes. In some games there are. I think I've got a set for World Cup Soccer. Um, you end up becoming a pack rat if you're not careful. Um, you'll find that, wow, I, I need slingshot plastics. I better order 50 of them just in case. Um, you do become a pack rat. But the issue with placements and most plastics in general is you have to buy the entire set. So you're looking at 100 plus. Mm -hmm. So if you're only looking for one plastic, you, you know, that you've got to factor that in. But sometimes you can't even get a whole set. Well, that's true. Too. I mean, that's, you know, that's a different problem. Yeah. So, um, so I'm trying to figure out. Pre pretty much, I mean, stuff is out there. <laughs> Almost any game you want is out there. Some of the prices, though, are nuts because people know, hey, I've got the last one or two sets, right? So. There are also, if you go to some of these places that are selling machines, uh, some of the guys are nice enough or they will sell you individual pieces if they have them in their big bin sitting in the back. I've also seen where people have reproduced plastics, you know, maybe they have a clear plastic and they'll have like a piece of paper that has the artwork printed on it and they've fixed it to the bottom of their clear plastic. And, you know, that might work in a pinch. Uh, I've never tried that myself, I don't know how that would look, but it might be worth it if you have something that you don't have another option. Well, if I figure it out, I'll be rich. There you go, <laughs> you will be rich. We'll look for your booth next year. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, and you'll need to be up here talking. <laughs> um, I think that's basically it. I guess one other thing I wanted to talk about were just the general settings of a game. Um, you want to look at how difficult the game is playing. You also want to look at your audience. You know, in, in this show, um, most of the people that are going to be playing my games out there are pretty novice when it comes to pinball. Um, so I want the game to play a little easier. I don't need to make it as difficult. You know, I don't need, you know, 10 second ball times out there, because all that's going to do is discourage people. Um, so I'm going to make the game play pretty close to factory. Um, I usually turn on extra balls, especially for things like replays and stuff out here, because a replay really doesn't matter um, when you're playing it for free anyway. So I like to give people a reward for getting to whatever the replay value is. Um, again, that's just personal preference. Some people, you know, especially if you're waiting in line behind somebody that gets one of those extra balls, you might not like it as much. Um, I also want to make sure the game is level, which we already talked about. Absolutely make sure you've got the game set on free play. Um, there's so many times when you walk up to a game and you hit the start button and nothing happens because somebody forgot to set it on free play, so definitely make sure you've done that. If the game can't be set on free play because it's an older game, um, most of the time you can at least set the replay value low enough that every, pretty much everybody that walks up to it will get a replay. And then you just need to put a handful of credits on it and it'll just keep, keep going indefinitely. Um, otherwise, you're just going to have to, every so often, come and put 30 or 40 credits on it so that people can continue to play your game. I noticed on Party Zone, when we've got it on free play and that's splashing, mm -hmm. that button tends to get hot. Yes. Is that normal? Yes. It's just, it's an incandescent light in there. So it is going to build up some heat. It's meant for it. Okay. It's designed for that. I mean, if you touched any of the buttons out there, you probably noticed the same thing. It's getting down. Now, if it's super bright, if you notice that the ball was super bright, then it could be a defective ball. Uh, it could be that the, that the filament has shorted and actually made a, a smaller filament, which will cause it to be brighter. It should burn out pretty quick in that case, but it can overheat it that way. So you want to make sure that it's not super bright, but otherwise it's, it's going to be normal. Um, yeah, I also have a note on here about tournament setup versus free play. Yeah, the games that we have in the tournament room over here are quite a bit more difficult. Um, things like the outlines are much further open. Uh, sometimes rubber posts have been removed, especially from the outline area. Uh, any center posts are going to be removed. Um, the game's going to tilt a lot easier than it will on the, on the floor. Again, you know, you're setting it up for your audience. Um, you know that the people in here are going to be good at pinball, they want a challenge. Uh, versus the people on the floor that just want to have a good time. So know the people that you're, that you're showing for and make sure that you've got your game set up appropriately for them. That's about it.
I'm sorry we kind of ran over a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to say our, um, the next person coming in to this room is at 5.30. Um, Snow Galvin is doing a talk about um, competitive football and tournament playing. And well, I believe the world is here for her. She wants to okay. <laughs> demo a um, But we can certainly hang out for a few minutes if you have any specific questions for us. I mean, and feel free to hang out, you know, and just wait for her to come in. Um, I think it's going to be nice. Arabian Nights, one of your games? I'm sorry? Arabian Nights. Yes, on the floor in there, yes. Well, it's working. Well, <laughs> well, well it, it just disappeared and come back. It would, it would never set up the, the third ball. It would never come up the third ball. Okay, I'll have to take a look at it. I'm not sure what that would be. I, we walked past it. We walked past it before we came in here, and it, somebody was playing it, so you know, it must not be consistent. Dump, 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 the ball's not coming up. It's not catching that ball. It's setting it up. Okay. We'll take a look at it. It's a lot of um, mystery solving. <laughs> yeah, you run in, you run into that sort of thing a lot. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate it.